you know, if you were to just watch a couple episodes of Adventure Time, you may not really think of it as anything more than just a whimsical, silly, slightly psychedelic cartoon inspired by D&D, or maybe like a surreal Simpsons, but it is more. Before there was time, before there was anything, there was nothing. And before there was nothing, there were monsters. It's dark, dude. After watching a few episodes, you may not necessarily see that it's a towering achievement of world building on par with The Lord of the Rings, but that's what it is. Like The Lord of the Rings, Adventure Time has a very consistent cosmogony. Cos is it cosmogony or cosmogony? It's giving me cosmology. Oh, that's not the word, dude. I guess I could just say cosmology. It doesn't really make a big difference. I like cosmogony. I do too. It's a good word. Good cosmogony. Cosmogony. Huh. Cosmogony. We'll just... Like The Lord of the Rings, Adventure Time has a very consistent cosmogony stretching back into deep time with thematic motifs that are reflected in emotional truths discovered by individual characters while also having all the musical interludes that Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings films lacked. Cosmogony. You can actually watch the entire show of Adventure Time and not even realize that the show is trying to say something important about how time works, about how each generation has a duty to the next generation to preserve all the things that make life meaningful. It's yours, idiot! <laughs> Don't you recognize your own baby? I mean, the quirky setup of all these talking candies is actually terrifying if you change the angle slightly. Now I'm going to cut out Princess Bubblegum's heart and make out with it. A nuclear war creates a new kind of radiation which eliminates all life and yet brings inanimate objects to life. This is a world whose previous generation failed entirely to preserve nearly anything of value. Oh, everything's gone. Except for these greeting cards. Oh. It's whimsical on the surface, but it's pretty dark under the hood. I mean, vampires have been neutered of any real threat for a long time in our culture, so it's not too shocking to see a vampire as an ally. And yet, even as an ally, Marceline can be horrifying. I couldn't watch that old man suffer, Jake. My code of honor wouldn't allow it. <laughs> oh, my code of honor wouldn't allow it. <laughs> the show reminds us that she's not inherently good and that her powers come from a demonic realm. Her moral alignment is entirely contingent upon Jake and Finn being fun to hang around with. I mean, this is a fallen world, a post-apocalyptic world a wounded world. It's a tragic world where even the life-bestowing Princess Bubblegum, a sort of viscous mother goddess, is also an Apollonian fascist ruling her own creations from an ivory tower, wielding science as a weapon. I just finished programming a proper simulation of a soul. In fact, this is much easier to manipulate than a real one. Well, the fact that it's a candy tower does not make it any less dystopian. And yet, the protagonist does his best in this fallen world. Finn, rendered by lesser writers, would be a romantic hero. He's the last human being on the planet. You can see him wandering a barren landscape, going slowly insane with no human companion, but instead he's a kind of Shakespearean, sexless Rosalind, a Robin Hood, halfway in drag, having one hell of a time while he kicks the bad guy's ass and saves the princess. He is the definition of the post-ironic, as well as a prime example of camp. He's a caricature of the thing he takes seriously, being a hero. In fact, when you're the last human on Earth, that may be the only way to be a hero, to embrace even the most tired tropes, as though they were being expressed for the very first time, as if every single adventure was the first one, as if time itself was just beginning. Finn, like the protagonist of a Studio Ghibli film, is morally incorruptible. Slay this ant! Is it evil? No! Will you slay it? He's able to shoulder responsibility like an adult while retaining a childlike awe at the world around him. And even in the most dire situations, he's able to engage with other people and reality itself through play. Whatever. He's a fool, but an enlightened fool. He has a good time because he knows no matter how much he progresses or regresses, there will always be an eternity on either side of him. He's always right in the middle. The appearance of Finn's father in this context is a true catalyst for change. He's both a ghost of an unknown past, Finn has a father, Finn has a past, he didn't just pop out of thin air, while being the specter of a failed future. Oh, we, we don't have a star skipper. Also Finn's your son. 
What? No star skipper. Uh -um. I said, Finn's your son. He came a long way to meet you. Son? Oh, hey, good for you, kid. Finn could have had a family. He could have been part of a long legacy stretching back into the prehistory of humanity. Instead, he exists outside of time, with no awareness of his own cultural or familial heritage, with no history. Finn sees in his father something he is incapable of conceiving of from the start. Disloyalty. But you're not really making it sound bad. It's not bad. I'm just giving you the choice of a new mode of existence. I feel like I put a lot of work into this meat reality. I'd like to see it through. Fair enough. Hey, how about I get a new mode? Are you seriously trying to bail out again? There is no such thing in Finn's moral universe. For him, brotherhood is the bedrock that everything else stands upon. Finn continuously turns even his worst enemies into brothers. Ah, this is red! I'm hot again! Or babies, in a blind faith that friendship is the normal state of reality, while adversity is the anomaly. Finn is nothing like his father, and he's never in danger of becoming like him. When Finn's father continues to abandon him, Finn is less wounded than he is disillusioned. Finn is not haunted by childhood traumas. Can dance like a man. I can shake him my fanny. I can shake him my can. He's haunted by recent ones. Ones we actually see play out before our eyes and which might traumatize the audience too. Finn's psychological war is not with that part of himself which is like his father, but rather that part of himself which denies his father. Finn's lesson is appropriately horrifying. He must become less brotherly and more pragmatic. There's a part of him which cannot draw healthy boundaries, and as a result, he makes things so much worse for everyone. It's at this moment that Finn truly steps out of the fool archetype and becomes a hero. But it's not romanticized as a great achievement, it's horrific, it's a painful passage. The grass sword haunts Finn as an emblem of the limits of brotherhood and the tragic need to wage war. War has loomed over every generation more than our own. Our wars are decentralized in space and dispersed in time. We deal with the end of world anxiety in terms of mother climate change rather than father atom bomb. Our generation lacks a fetishistic object to hang its anxieties upon, and as a result, our greatest wars are internal. Our greatest enemies are ourselves. And Adventure Time bravely proposes a solution to our inherent fatalism. The solution is whimsy. TV is weird. I mean, even if you skip these intros, you still end up watching them millions of times. You end up seeing the same images again and again. You end up hearing the same song again and again, hearing the same lyrics again and again. And after 10 seasons of looking at this intro again and again, I came to associate that shing on the sword there with the words. Finn and Jake exist outside of historical time. They live in a cyclical time. It's a time of no consequences. They're always teenagers. They always end every episode where they began. In the same outfit, in the same treehouse. They never age, they never lose limbs, they never change. But as the show goes on, they do lose limbs. They do age, they do change. And after 10 seasons, the show reaches its teleology with a grand finale where the characters face their own mortality. Far from being a denial of how hopeless reality can be, Adventure Time goes through this hopelessness and comes out the other side. Until the end of time. Yay! The whimsy of Adventure Time is mythologically significant. In one very unique episode, the show makes this abundantly clear. An impending storm comes to threaten life as we know it. The gang all prepare for the worst. All except Jake, the masculine metamorph, the force of constant movement, but mental stasis. Jake can't help prepare. The fear paralyzes Jake, where it spurs heroic Finn into action. Jake cannot compartmentalize his fear. He has to confront it head on. His contribution to the apocalyptic preparations is neither shelter nor food, but art. Jake is an archetypal artist. He's sensitive, he's ever-changing, and yet he's a constant child. At first, the others see Jake's contribution as a decadent waste of time, a useless fantasy, when what we need is sober realism and concrete action. Yet, in the post-apocalyptic, animistic universe of Ooh, 
Even storms are living beings with faces, personalities, and voices. Even storms can be bargained with. And it turns out that Jake's whimsy is the only thing that did any good at all in saving their lives. This standalone episode, more than anything else, sets up the stage for the finale, where a cosmic threat appears so great that it seems time itself will come to an end. An evil so great that no one has any power to stop it, lest everyone come together to face it as one. When it comes to uniting people, the authoritarian is less than useless. Uh, mm, terrible uh, plan! But mm, no! But my- My plan! Hot air balloon! Hey! Now's not the time! Unless we win this fight today, we all get to take a nice pet butt style sponge bath in Uncle Gumball's extra strength lobotomy sauce. Understand? No, not really. Even the hero archetype is powerless because it's not individual competence that gets people on the same page. People need a mythology to unite them. The real heroes at the end are the fools. It's the artists. The ones who accept disaster with a smile. The ones who look into the abyss and say, What's all the rockers out there? Oh, it's up to Bima to say that. It, it turned out to be one of the one of the one of the joys of my life. Uh, last episode we recorded, I we had to. I'm not gonna. I can't. I can't say what happens, but uh, I could barely get through it uh, emotionally, and I've never really had that happened to me before. There are no demons coming out of our skies, and yet we do live in apocalyptic times. There's a hostility to art in general, and specifically towards old art. But when I think of the Library of Alexandria going up in flames, or the vast codices of the Mayans being burnt to a crisp, or the languages of so many indigenous people being forgotten, I weep. So much of our collective human story has already been lost. So many torches have been dropped. I find the glib acceptance or even the celebration of such losses to be deeply disturbing. I didn't get it. Now, wh what was with the fire stick? You mean the torch? It's crucial that we keep the whimsy alive. It's crucial that we not become like Finn's father, abandoning future generations to figure it out on their own. It's crucial that we fight to protect our art, our cosmogony, everything that has made life meaningful for so long. What I love so much about Adventure Time is that even though it acknowledges how close we are to losing our entire cultural heritage, how bad things really are, it's endlessly optimistic. Even if the worst comes to pass, even if our cultural memory is entirely wiped clean, even if the last human dies or is put in a VR simulation forever, time itself will never end. There will always be new forms of life. There will always be more stories to tell. There will always be another adventure.